Hey, it's Dry Bear. And as a serial altaholic, I'm here to help you decide on what vocation you should be picking in Dragon's Dogma 2. There are a lot of choices to be made, skills to unlock, augments and core passives to be put on, and some gear to be applied on top of it that can drastically change your experience as you go through the vast world of Dragon's Dogma 2. But before we walk through each individual vocation, there's some very important notes that you need to be aware of. Since the vocation system and party system along with the pawn system work pretty differently than most other RPG games. Firstly, even though it is a single player game, you will be an element as part of a fighting squad. What this means is that it doesn't matter what weaknesses or strengths your character has, as you'll be able to supplement that with the other characters, the pawns that exist inside of your group. So don't feel like you are forced to play a specific role or fill a specific spot, because you can very easily fill those gaps with the pawns you add. The next thing is the combat in Dragon's Dogma 2 is incredibly dynamic. Not only will you be surrounded by enemies sometimes, or you'll be facing a giant enemy with tons of weak points and areas that you can target, but you can also cause tons of status effects. You can mount large monsters and crawl along them. You can grab onto their legs and make them fall. There's tons of different things that you can accomplish with each individual role that might be beyond just simple dealing damage. So you'll want to think about all these things as you're going through and creating your party composition. Next is a really important distinction. You should think about your main character, the Arisen, and your main pawn as your core party, because essentially they are. These two characters will be the characters you're playing the main character, and your main pawn will always be with you permanently, and you will be able to level them up, change their gear, and play them like you normally would an RPG character. Then you can recruit or reinforce your party with additional pawns from other people's playthroughs that they've created, using the pawn system and the rift. And I make this distinction because these pawns that are support pawns that you'll bring in won't level the same or at all, and you'll have to swap them in and out, and you can freely choose what they do, and you won't have to worry so much about the choices you're making on them. And while you can give them gear, usually this is a temporary thing, you'll end up getting that gear back as you swap in new support pawns and have to re-equip them with the new stuff. Next, I'd like to address a misnomer as well. There are four starting vocations that you will find at the character creation screen. And many times when you have a basic skill or basic class system that goes into an advanced class system, most of the time in games, this is represented as the advanced classes are stronger. And in Dragon's Dogma, that just isn't the case. All vocations are essentially equal. Think of the starting vocations as your more oh, like broader focused in, t in their tool set, and then the more advanced vocations are more focused in what they do, but it doesn't mean that a warrior is stronger than a fighter or a sorcerer is stronger than a mage, it just means that they have access to different abilities and at different skill sets. You could totally make a party that just has a thief, an archer, a fighter, and a mage that goes all the way through the game and you'll be just fine. Also, it'll function a little bit differently than the the first game for anyone who played, the first four are the starting vocation. So the fighter, the archer, the thief, and the mage are your starting vocations that you, your main character, the Arisen, and your main pawn will select at character creation. And then on top of that, as you go through the story, you will be able to unlock new vocations that you and your character can set, or that you can recruit in the support pawns through the rift system later on in the story. However, they've drawn a pretty clear line in Dragon's Dogma 2 in that these six vocations, the starting four, as well as Warrior and Sorcerer are available to the Risen and the Pawns, but the final four are highly specialized vocations that are only available to your character. These are Risen exclusive vocations. That is the Magic Archer, which mixes the Archer and the Mage into a dual element class. The Mystic Spearhand, which is like a fighter and a mage together that uses a spear or a glaive. The Trickster, which is a super cool character, which we'll talk about more later in the video. And the Warfarer or Wayfarer, which is a super unique job. Both the Trickster and the, war the Wayfarer will need more explanation as we get further into the video. But just keep that in mind that your pawns will only be the far left side six vocations and then the far right side the more specialized unique niche vocations you will only be available for the arisen character 
Also, don't worry that you, your main, your arisen and your main pawn can change vocation throughout the story as much as you want. You'll just pay a fee. So if you start out as a fighter and you decide you don't like it and you want to switch to a sorcerer or you want to switch over to a trickster and then back down to a thief, you can certainly do that. You'll just go to a vendor, pay a fee, get that rotation, and you'll have to unlock that new vocation and start working on it. You and your main pawn can both do this. And then if you decide that you have a support pawn that you summoned into your world that you has a job or a vocation, you don't like, you will just dismiss them and summon a new one that has a different vocation that might fit what you're looking for. And the drawback here is twofold. Not only will you have to pay a fee uh, either with discipline or with currency, depending on where you are in the story, to change your vocation, but also you need to level up the vocation individually. So say the more you spend time on a vocation, the more discipline you build up, the more experience you build up, you will actually level up that vocation, which will unlock better and better skills. So if you decide to respec to a new vocation, you will have to level that new one up by completing quests and fighting monsters and getting experience. There's also a brand new system with the maestros that they have in the, the new Dragon's Dogma 2 system. Not only will you have your base skills, passives, augments, abilities that you can unlock for that vocation, but you also can get more as you level up that vocation. And additionally, which is brand new in this game, you will be able to find these maesters or maestros throughout the world which are grand masters in that vocation so you might find a mystic spear hand maester in a town somewhere and if you gain their a favor you will be able to learn or earn tomes that unlock secret hidden abilities and passives for that vocation that wasn't available at trainers when it comes to party composition you can make any composition that you want to work the things that i would recommend looking out for as you're putting your composition together is mostly just going to be covering all your bases having range for flying monsters like harpies that come in having good aoe and crowd control and that deal with monsters and preferably having someone that can deal with drawing the attention of the monsters whether that's a trickster a fighter or warrior or even a, a mystic spear hand that can really get into that or even if you play really well the warfarer or wayfarer uh, which is a super unique vocation and also keep in mind that each of these vocations use specific gear so if you have a lot of the same vocation you may struggle to get uh, gear distributed between them but enough yapping let's start with the fighter which is your sword and board basic all-rounder combat specialist for dragon's dogma 2. they are very good at staying in melee range they use a sword and shield and they have a lot of different ways to buff themselves the people around them they can taunt to draw enemies towards them by banging their shield and they have a lot of ways to deal status effects and front melee damage to the target as well they can pretty much do anything relating to basic combat. They're also excellent at mounting monsters and climbing on monsters because they're so durable. So if you run into a mountain troll and you want to break off one of their tusks or stab them in the eye to weaken them, or you can even jump on one of their legs and have someone jump on the other leg or deal damage to the leg to cause them to fall. Fighters are super good at this because they're so durable and flexible with how they play. And I think even if you don't play a fighter as your main character, your Arisen, it's very likely you'll see a lot of fighters, at least one fighter in every party because they're just so dang useful and flexible in almost every possible situation. Now the Strider from Dragon's Dogma 1 was basically a combination of Archer and Thief in Dragon's Dogma 2 and I think the reason they split this is a good one in that it also just felt like there was too much going on for one vocation in the first game because the Strider was split between dagger skills and flurry attacks and combo attacks with the daggers and then you also had your, your short bow and attacks from that. Uh, or even your longbow when you switch up into the higher vocations. And I think that just felt like it was too much for one job. So they split it up into two and the archer is going to be the one that focuses on the range attacks. Archer uses the bow and arrow as the primary and this seems rather simple, but there's actually a ton of things that you can do with arrow types and positioning in Dragon's Dogma 2. You can have silencing arrows that you use to silence casters from a distance, explosive arrows, oil arrows that coat targets gets in fire then you have the mage set everyone ablaze to start burning them there's poison arrows elemental arrows there's so many different things that you can do with the ammo types and the skill that you bring to the battlefield as an archer that it becomes a really awesome choice for people that like having that kind of strategic approach to how they battle now unlike the fighter especially if you're playing the archer as your main vocation for your arisen just be aware that not every enemy that you face will fight your melee target some of the 
enemies, especially bandits and some monsters, will focus on the back line, which means they'll run towards you and start attacking you to go around your melee fighters, no matter who's in your party. So as a ranged character, you will have to be very wary of what, come to what comes towards you and playing around your dead zone as people get close. But there's tons of different skills that you can unlock, being able to knock targets down, cause gusts of wind, knock them far away from you. You can jump up and jump off their head. You can bounce off of walls and do airstrikes, a really cool attack. So this is kind of like your Legolas style character, but has a lot of utility with the kind of ammunition that you use with your bow. The Thief has really evolved in Dragon's Dogma 2 to be just honestly one of the flashiest of vocations you can play and are super fun to inter interact with, especially when you're talking about the large monsters that you'll encounter. They wield dual daggers, one in each hand, and they have super fast flurry attacks, spin attacks, aerial attacks, and tons of ways to get in and out of the fight. They also have non-combat abilities like stealing from enemies and NPCs, which adds to a nice a little extra element to your role playing. And they have a lot of contextual moves as well, where you can trigger sliding under the monster or sliding up the monster, or even like a Monster Hunter style dual blade spin attack, where you turn into a Beyblade and start dealing damage to them all over the place. They're not as tanky as a fighter or as a war warrior, but they're super fast and agile, especially when you start getting some of the later game augments that can make you very dexterous. So if you like dealing damage, getting in and getting out with quick hit and run tactics, and you also like mounting the monster to to do tons of really fun stuff, I think Thief is right up your alley. Next is the mage, which is kind of like your all magic type caster. Unlike the sorcerer who may specialize in offensive or destruction magic, the mage uses all kinds of magic, support magic, healing magic, offensive magic, elemental magic, everything. Just a general all rounder when it comes to magic. And for that reason, you'll probably see a lot of people using at least one mage pawn in their party, just because there's a ton of buffs and augments and support and healing that you can get from having a mage around. Now, keep in mind that you can give healing items and you can craft healing items. You can give them to your pawns. You can keep them on yourself. You can craft them. So you don't need a healer, but it is nice to have one because it gives you that extra little bit of protection and buffer. But not only that, but they have ways to add elemental attacks to your weapons. They can buff your weapons and give you extra damage. They can also, like if you do a holy augment on a weapon, like you imbue a weapon with holy, it serves as a flashlight in dark areas like caves or in uh, at super like dark nighttime areas. And remember that you are part of a total overall element. So there are some really cool mechanics that come from casting in this game that are pretty different than say like an archer would as a ranged character. Not only can you cast spells, but a lot of the offensive magics can be held for longer to get increased effects. Maybe you can have them shoot three times in quick succession instead of once. You can increase the area of effect or other statuses or elements of that, or just cause more damage from it the longer you hold it, which means that if you have a good party around you as a caster, you can spend that time setting up using the right spell at the right time. And you also want to learn what elements are good against which enemy type. Some monsters are weak to lightning, some are weak to poison, some are weak to fire, some of us are scared of ice, and which one you use changes how you impact the battle. Not to mention the support aspect is super useful. You can cleanse status ailments like poison, you can heal people up, you can buff them and bolster them, or change their element type of attack. And that concludes the starting vocations for the game that you'll be able to select on character creation. As you level up a little bit and venture forth into the world, you'll unlock all of the advanced vocations that you can pick for your characters, and the first is going to be the warrior. And the warrior, like the fighter, focuses on direct combat dealing melee damage, and they forego their shield and defense for more offense, and they wield two-handed weapons like the great sword or a great hammer to do tons and tons of damage to targets. They're also still very good at mounting enemies and monsters and dealing damage to weak points because of this. And as far as single hit damage output, it's probably warrior and sorcerer that have the highest, but again, they are a little bit slower and heavier for that reason. So if you like dealing big single target damage, you like one-shotting things, um, warrior might be a good choice for you in that regard. And while they don't have as much of the utility that you'd see from a fighter with being able to buff or taunt or redirect the battle, they still do have some nice shouts and some uh, support abilities that can help affect the battle in ways that are unique to their vocation. And they're also still one of the most sturdy in the game compared to all the other vocations except for maybe fighter. So if you like being able to get into the fray, get surrounded by enemies, or get in the face of a dragon or a griffin or a manticore and feel like you can still go toe to toe, then picking the fighter might be right, right for you. Next is the sorcerer and is the 
last vocation on this list that can be selected by pawns. And this one basically takes the mage and foregoes all of the healing and support magic to focus on even better destructive magic. This is actually one of my favorite vocations from Dragon's Dogma 1 for that reason. You can do some really ridiculous room-wide AoEs that kill everything in sight, and they, they take that from a, like a 10 out of 10 from Dragon's Dogma 1 to like a 20 out of 10 in Dragon's Dogma 2. Some of these spells like Meteor or the Tornado Storms are just ridiculously strong. So if you like just building up for a big destruction and blowing everything away from you while your, your party of pawns fights around you, then Sorcerer is definitely the way to go. And again, keep in mind, unlike the Mage, you will be able to do more damage, but you also will not be able to have access to all of the support and healing that you would have with the starting vocation. They specialize in an arch staff or a large staff that it focuses on heavier magic, and then it will be their main weapon. And in general, most of their spells on average take a lot longer to finish. They have a lot more wind up and a lot more time planning. So you kind of want to, you can move while casting, so you kind of figure it out, but you do want to have a good strategic approach. It's kind of like Archer where you want to figure out where you're going to stand, what you're going to use, what spell is the most important, and getting a good uh, surveillance of the battlefield that you move through as you're planning out your spells because they are very huge, very large effect, but much slower in comparison to the mage spells, for example. Moving on to the four vocations that are exclusive to the Arisen, the main character. And most of these have either very specialized skill sets or have a hybridization of two or more skill sets from the previous vocations we've mentioned. Starting with the Magic Archer, which is a super big improvement on the DD1 version of this. And they essentially have kind of a combination of magic and archery. And it's not as direct as you might think. They can have energy focused bows or bows made completely out of light. They do use casting spells. They also have access to support magic, which is super nice, which means that even, even if you're not running a mage, you can play a magic archer. You can cast healing from a range. You can do buffs and custom things like that. And you have tons of ways to do lots of crowd control. So you take the utility of a archer and the functionality of a mage, you put them together into the magic archer, and you can basically do almost anything on the battlefield. If you wanted to be the king emperor or empress supreme that does everything possible, jack of all trades, master of all things, then magic archer is probably the choice for you, as you will be able to have an answer to any possible situation with this vocation. And obviously, since you have a combat focus and a casting focus, you will be able to switch between those and what spells you choose to slot into your spell slots and what abilities you use to slot into your action ranged attack slots and also your augments and core skills will drastically change how a magic archer plays. Next is the Mystic Spear Hand. And again, this is exclusive to the Arisen. And this one is kind of like the Magic Knight from Dragon's Dogma 1, but with more focus on dealing actual damage. They have magic mixed in, so it's another magic hybrid vocation, just like the Magic Archer. But instead of using a shield like you would with the Magic Knight, you actually have a Glaive, Spear, or Halberd mixture that goes along with it. So you have super heavy focus on melee damage dealing, but you also have tons of magic as well. And they're also really good at moving around the battlefield and mounting monsters from really awkward angles. So if you run into like manticores that move a bunch, or if you run into griffins that go up into the air, you may want to have a mystic spear hand on deck so that they can get on top of that target and mount them and start dealing damage to the weak point or severing the snake tail so you stop getting poisoned. And while the mystic spear hand and the magic archer both have access to useful support type magic, overall, I would say on average, the mystic spear hand has more offensive magic available to them. They're definitely more of a damage dealer than an all rounder when it comes to that. So if you like getting into the fray, having tons of attacks, or you just like the Lancer from like the Fate series, then mystic spear hand is right up your alley. Next is another Arisen exclusive vocation and one that I absolutely love when developers include in a game, the Trickster. Now the Trickster is what I would call a non-combat character. They don't really overtly focus on dealing direct damage in direct means. They don't have ways to trade blows with a target. And these are the kind of like the mesmers and the really unique uh, utilitarian style jobs and classes that exist in RPG games that make super unique and fun interactions. So if you're up for an interesting challenge or you want something brand new that you probably 
probably haven't experienced in many other games, if at all ever, then I would recommend checking out the Trickster. The main weapon of the Trickster is the Sensor, which is just a smoke uh, container that dispews smoke and mist uh, and uh, just general smoke all over the battlefield that can do different things. And they can use this smoke to buff allies, not in the way of like a mage or a magic archer where you can apply elemental bonuses. It's more like just giving you a raw damage increase. And this buff is actually quite substantial. You can make all of your pawns in your party do insanely high damage for a short period of time after giving this buff. And if you run with maybe like a warrior and a sorcerer or and like an archer in your party of pawns and you buff them, you're going to burn down targets very, very quickly. But not only that, but they have tons of things that go along the lines of misdirection. They can create illusions or clones that stand on the battlefield. Kind of reminds me of Mesmer from Guild Wars, where you can actually just distract and reorient enemies. They also have a pseudo taunt where they can draw the attention of enemies towards them or towards an illusion of theirs, which means that you can easily reposition enemies. If there's a fight that you're going on against a mountain troll or a large monster or even a bunch of small monsters and you want to get a better vantage point, lead them into a choke point, lead them to a cliff or a natural environmental hazard that you can use to damage them or kill them, you can use that on the trickster to guide them and reposition them th throughout the fight. You can also create tons of illusions of walls that enemies will think are real and not go belt pass core. You can create fake bridges and juts that look like you can stand on, but you actually can't because it's just smoke. So enemies will jump on top of them and fall to their death or fall into a river or land on some trap that you set up for them. And all in all provides for a very unique experience in Dragon's Dogma 2. And lastly, we have the Wayfarer or the Warfarer. I've actually seen official uh, marketing materials from Capcom and the Dragon's Dogma 2 team use both of these titles, Wayfarer and Warfarer. I don't know if it's just a translation thing. Uh, their official website says Warfarer, but a lot of their marketing materials can say Wayfarer on them. One of the two. But this is essentially a everything type vocation. Again, this is a Risen exclusive, so only your main character will be able to play this job. And if you've ever played Rubik from Dota or Blue Mage in Final Fantasy, this is kind of what this is getting at. The Wayfarer or Warfarer can use every single possible weapon in every possible way. They don't have any limitations in the gear that they select, and they can mix and match things as well. On top of that, they can also pull abilities, spells, augments, all kinds of things from every other vocation in the game. And the drawback for this, because obviously there would have to be a drawback, is in general, they're not going to be as strong as the main users of them. Their base stats are pretty low, they're kind of squishy, and so you really want to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the things that you're borrowing from other vacations or vocations which obviously if you know an enemy is super weak to dark or holy or ice being able to have that as an option is super great if you have an enemy that's weak to mounting and maybe you want to do more mounting the wayfarer or warfarer can do all of it and you'll be able to respec and change and shift your strengths and utilities to fit the situation that you're currently in and might be a fun way to play as your main character because then you can fill any gap that arises in the moment without having to go back to the rift or re-change the vocation for your main pawn. And all in all, I'm very glad they added the Wayfarer and the Trickster to the game because it makes just one-of-a-kind experiences that are not like the other vocations available to all other characters. It just makes this you know, special kind of experience that you'll get only with these vocations. And that's all 10 vocations in Dragon's Dogma 2, plus the pawn system and the party system in the game. I hope this has been helpful, and let me know which vocation you're planning for your main character, your Arisen, and your main pawn, or maybe even your whole party down below in the comments. If you found value in today's video, leave a like down below, leave a comment for the algorithm to help this video get seen by more people, and don't forget to check out my other channels for other content and other stuff and other things.